Today, we'll talk about whether or not you should be concerned about Anthony Richardson, what the Florida Gators 12 personnel setup will look like, and we'll wrap up by talking about the Florida Gators spring game, only here on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Gators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. We are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props odds, and lines than ever before. Bet online is where the game starts. Happy Thursday. I'm Brandon Olson. You can find me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. You can find all of my written work with Whole Nine Sports. That is W-H-O-L-E and I-N-E Sports. Before getting into today's content, just going to ask you to like, subscribe, wherever you're listening, leave a comment, review. Let me know how I can make the show better. Let me know what you like. Let me know what you hate. It's probably me. That part ain't going to change. Sorry about that, but it is greatly appreciated. Getting into today's content, we are talking about Anthony Richardson and we're talking I was I wasn't going to do this till tomorrow but I got a YouTube comment yesterday uh and, and they brought it up so thank you for bringing this up but I was yeah like I said originally going to talk this about tomorrow but I was like hey why not just move it up a day since it's what people want to talk about they asked and here's a quote uh is it reading too much into it to be even a little concerned from rumblings that Richardson is having issues throwing the ball this spring and that's it and I, I want to give you my stance on it um because I'm a little concerned with the reports about Anthony Richardson throwing the ball, his accuracy. Um, but I'll, I'll give you my take, and then, you know, I want you to let me know if you're concerned with it. Uh, because here's the first thing we can address about it. The knee. Uh, we know that Anthony Richardson tore his meniscus last season. It was a nagging injury that hurt for a while, got really bad last year, and so got that fixed. Um Torres meniscus, been, Torres meniscus has been recovering since then. I'll tell you guys, I've said it before, like I've torn my meniscus before, but it was not the kind that you need surgery on. Surgery was an option. And I was like, no, thank you. Not cutting into my knee. Um, so yes, yeah, and it, it took a little while to heal. So it is possible that Anthony Richardson is still healing from that knee and that he's still being hindered from that knee. It's also very possible that Anthony Richardson is still hurting because he might have rushed back from that knee injury because of course, there was a quarterback competition to get to. Once spring ball started, it was Anthony Richardson, Emory Jones, Jack Miller the third from Ohio State. And, and uh, Emory Jones has entered the transfer portal since then, so it's Anthony Richardson versus Jack Miller the third. And maybe Anthony Richardson was like, you know what, I, I, I can't miss this quarterback battle because of a knee injury. There's a spring game where it's probably going to be QB1 versus QB2. And if I'm out because of a knee injury and I'm and I'm at the back of the list because of a knee injury, then that's going to really mess me up. So it's very possible that he rushed back from that knee injury. There's no doubt about that. It, it, that could be the issue. The issue could also be that he's having maybe a little bit of a, a little bit of a slow time finding his rhythm and timing in a new offense. Because I get it, a lot of people. If you if you're looking from the outside in, you could easily go. You know, a curl route's a curl route. Uh, a slant's a slant, no matter what. Uh, things change depending on the offense. You know, maybe 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 a receiver's like running a seven yard curl, and now they're nine yard curls, and things change. Whatever it might be, that's just an example. Uh, so that could be it, finding a rhythm in the new offense. But here's my issue. Here's what concerns me. I'm not super concerned about the knee being what's messing up his throwing. I'm not super concerned about the rhythm being what's messing up his throwing. What I am concerned about, because it's been an issue that I've been bringing up since the first game of the season last year, um, and y'all were ready to behead me when I brought this up, but the issue that from that's coming over from last season that remains, um, Anthony Richardson, for as talented as he is, for as great as he can be, and like I've said, I think he has the potential to legitimately become an elite NFL quarterback. When you look for tools... He has all of them, but there is the concern that remains from last season of Anthony Richardson, again, for as talented as he is and as great as he can be, he is not an accurate passer. That's just what he, and I, I love Anthony Richardson, but that's just being honest with you. Anthony Richardson is not known for being an accurate passer. He's not that guy. He is a very bright passer. He's very smart. He is, I mean, he panics, but he's a very smart passer. 
He is, he, he's got one of, if not the strongest arm in college football right now, but he's not super accurate. That's been an issue. You know, you look at the first game of the season when he's overthrowing, you know, fourth string receivers. And the excuse that fans tried to give him was he's throwing the fourth string receivers. And I'll say the same thing today that I said then. Um, that means nothing. You're a quarterback. Your job's to get the ball to your receiver. It doesn't matter who it is. I don't care if you're throwing to a lineman. Get the ball to him. But he struggles with injuries. He's just not an accurate pass. I mean, he struggles with accuracy. He's just not an accurate passer. He also does struggle with injuries. But that's what he is. That, that That's all it is. The spring, spring ball inaccuracy is nothing new. If the question was, should I now be concerned? Then I, if you weren't before, I don't think so. If the question is, should I be concerned about his knee? I think maybe um, he's someone who, like I said, he, he struggled with injuries throughout college so far. He The last year, he was very, very unhealthy. Uh, that could be part of the strength and conditioning program, nutrition, whatever it might be. Hopefully that's fixed. Maybe you're concerned about the knee. But if the question is, should I be concerned about Anthony Richardson's accuracy in general? I think so. Um I, like I, I've, I've been very open about it. I, he's not a very accurate passer. Uh, I think, yes, you should be concerned about his accuracy. But if you weren't concerned about his accuracy before, I don't think anything's changed. You're just seeing a larger sample size. That's all it is. You're just getting a better look at him. So maybe you should be concerned about it. I, I have been. That's been some of me. And keep in mind, I'm saying this as someone who's also saying Anthony Richardson should be the starting quarterback of the Florida Gators. I, I think that both can make, both those can be true. He, he struggles with accuracy and you should be concerned about it. But you take the bad with the good. And Anthony Richardson, phenomenal arm, phenomenal athlete, can develop to be a, a superstar quarterback. So yeah, I think you should be a bit concerned with his accuracy. But at the same time, that's one of those concerns where you just live with it because you're getting a, a stud, really. And we're about to move to the more scheme-based discussion of today's episode with the 12 personnel setup. But first, I'm going to talk to you guys about Athletic Greens because our newest partner has a product that I use literally every day. I started taking Athletic Greens because while I've been trying to eat healthier, I got summer vacation coming up. It's hard sometimes to eat healthy, work out, still get all the vitamins and nutrients you need while also working all day. You know, sometimes you work through lunch. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into flu and cold season and allergy season. And I'm just messed up right now. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash college. Again, that is athleticgreens.com dot com slash college to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Thanks again for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. We are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. Like I said, we're going to talk more about the scheme-based part of the Florida Gators today because we look at the scheme, we look at Billy Napier. We've, we've gone through this before. The uh, I think I called them the, the pillars of Billy Napier's scheme, and one of them was 12 personnel. And if you don't know uh 12 personnel is one running back two tight ends two wide receivers so that that's your skill the, the one two it's running back tight end and then whatever adds up to five is your receivers um and when we talk about 12 personnel i'm not really going to talk about quarterback or offensive line because i'm not talking about things that will remain constant you know whoever's the quarterback is going to be the quarterback in 12 13 14 i don't care 110 i don't care personnel so that doesn't change. Offensive line, also not going to change based on personnel. That's just not something that happens. Um, but the skill positions, the skill, they, they, those will change. I want to start off with the receivers because I think it's the easiest to talk about here um, because there are two wide receivers in 12 personnel. And given their ability as blockers, their position on the depth chart, and just their overall talent, don't expect it to change from being Xavier Henderson on one side and Justin Shorter on the other. Those are still the guys that you should expect to see in 12 personnel. Running back? I think when you look at running backs and you look at personnel groupings, uh, I think when you look at, you know, whether whether it's 21, 22, when there's two running backs, 
you usually look at the power back is going to be your halfback in that in that situation. When you look at 12, it can change a little bit. You know, you could see speedy guys come in, but I think when you look at 12 personnel, a lot of times you see a more balanced back come in. And so I think when we look at that, we're looking at Trevor Etienne and Montreal Johnson. I think those are the guys that we look at in 12 personnel. Uh, primarily because I think they've got just more ability as between the tackle runners. And I think when you have 12 personnel, you're more likely to kind of keep it in between the tight ends. You could also spring it out wide because here's the thing. When we talk about 12 personnel base, we're probably talking about one tight end on each side. But with the Florida Gators and Billy Napier and and all the move that's going to be happening, all the motion, uh, we're going to see two tight ends on one side, two tight ends on the other side. (laughs) We're going to see a lot change, I think. Uh, you know, maybe the wide receivers on the left, the tight ends on the right, running back on the right, and then we just see what happens. Um, but I think we look at Trevor Etienne and Montreal Johnson as those guys. I think Montreal Johnson is a bigger home run hitter up the middle, and I think Trevor Etienne is a little bit more of a, I mean, he's not really a punching the mouth Damian Pierce type, but I think he's just better in between the tackles. He's he's more thickly built. He's, he's probably going to get the tougher yards for you. And primarily, I think vision's a big thing for both of them. I think that's why they're going to be the primary guys in 12 personnel. Uh, but again, things are going to change. Uh, and, and I mean, running backs are going to change. Every running back seeing it worked in every personnel and every every scheme, whatever you want to call it, they're all going to get their run. Uh, but I think Trevor Etienne and Montreal Johnson might just be the favorites when we talk about 12 personnel, because again, I think they're going to be better between the tackles. And we look at a key part of 12 personnel is that, that two part, that second part, the tight ends. There's going to be two on the field at once. I think in pretty much pretty much every situation, every scenario, Keon Zipperer is going to be the a tight end on the field. Uh, I think he's going to be on a huge majority of the field, a huge majority of the time. Whether he's the inline tight end that that's typically thought of as more of like a blocking tight end, or the move tight end that that's thought of as the the speedier, dynamic receiving tight end, I think Keon Zipperer presents a very unique skill set for the Florida Gators where. He is a sound enough blocker to be the inline tight end. He is a, a, an athletic enough pass catcher to be the move tight end. And he, his size is fine to play both roles. I think that's important to talk about with uh, Keon Zipper being versatile enough to do both because I think that also opens up the, the discussion for uh, versatility, I'll say, because you can look at Keon Zipper. Let's, let's say in this scenario, Keon Zipper is the inline tight end, okay? So Keon Zipper is the inline tight end, and I think when you look at needing a move tight end, when you're looking for just a move tight end, you look at Nick Elksness and you look at Arliss Boardingham. Um, Nick Elksness and Arliss Boardingham, both both pass-catching receivers, uh, both pass-catching tight ends more than anything else. Uh, I, I, I kind of prefer Arliss Boardingham um, because, don't get me wrong, the move tight end is going to be going in motion a lot that's a thing but Arliss Boardingham presents a very unique skill set for the Florida Gators in the sense that he's a wide receiver tight end hybrid so we can see Arliss Boardingham go in motion and the defense has to react to him and we can see him come on the field and the defense has to react to him um but he allows the team to kind of quickly switch uh from there's still going to be 12 personnel but they can kind of go into this this pseudo 11 personnel because Arliss Boardingham can move to the slot or he can move out wide and you still have the same number of running backs, tight ends and wide receivers on the field, but you've got a tight end. That's kind of a wide receiver. And if he goes out wide, if the corner stays there, then you've got a linebacker safety or nickel on someone as big as Xavier Henderson and Justin Jorder. And there's a mismatch. Arlie Sportingham will likely be bigger than the outside corner as well. So you, you create a mismatch there with Arliss Boardingham as your primary move tight end, which I love Nick Elksness, but I, I think that when you're working to outsmart your opponents, Arliss Boardingham is kind of the guy that you're looking for. And then when we look at Keon Zipperer being the move tight end, we've got to have an inline tight end available. And I think that's Jonathan Odom when he's healthy or Hayden Hansen. That's my guess. Um, you know, every, every other tight end on the roster right now is, is hurt. Uh, Gage Wilcox, unfortunately... Uh, a likely career-ending injury, and then it's defensive players that have flipped to the offensive side of the ball to play tight end. So Jonathan Odom, I think, is a 
sound option as a blocker. <laughs> I have to think of that word. I, I don't want to say great because we don't know, but he's, I think, a sound option as an inline blocking tight end. Hayden Hansen, we know that's kind of his bread and butter. He, he's kind of been thought about that. I will also say that I'm of the mindset of it, it might be more new schooly, might be more old schooly, but the move tight end kind of being a blocking tight end. So I think that that really opens things up in the running game. Uh, so Hayden Hansen could play that role as well. But uh, yeah, I, I think when Zip is working as the move tight end, Jonathan Odom or Hayden Hansen will be working as the inline tight ends. And that's great. I think they're both solid blockers. Heck, I think we can run at some points where Jonathan Odom and Hayden Hansen are both on the field as both inline tight ends on opposite sides of the line or working on the same side of the line and just plowing through defenses. And that, I think that's a really fun thing to talk about. Um, I think it'd be really cool to see, but uh, I, I don't know if that will happen. But I'm I'm open for creativity and versatility here. But 12 personnel is going to be a crucial part of this offense. Get used to it. We know that a lot of offenses go 11 personnel, one one running back, one tight end, and three wide receivers. It creates a lot in the passing game. I get that. Billy Napier is going to want to run the ball, whether it's wide zone or power, whatever it's going to be. He's going to want to run the ball. So 12 personnel is going to be a crucial part of this Florida Gators offense. And also skill set wise and personnel wise, I think when they're healthy, Florida's got a solid personnel to run or Florida's got, Florida's got a solid roster to run 12 personnel pretty consistently. We're about to talk about the spring game that's coming up, but first I'm going to talk to you guys about Bet Online because March Madness is over. Baseball is here, and you can make yourself some money on Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. I've been using Bet Online for years. It's been five years now, and I couldn't be happier. It's got so much, not just basketball, not just baseball, not just football, heck, not even just sports. You can bet on reality TV, award shows, and so, so, so much more. I'm talking politics, the last number, the Dow Jones, which plant, which country aliens will invade first? Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn all about the trends and action. Check out Bet Online. It's where the game starts. To wrap up today's show, it's probably going to be a little bit of, of a briefer segment, but we're talking about the spring game uh, because I want to talk about the structure a little bit first. I think that's really cool. Uh, the orange and blue game will be four 15 minute quarters with a running clock, except for in the final four minutes of both halves. If that sounds a little familiar to you, it's because that's called a football game, um, which hasn't really been the case the past couple years under he who shall not be named, Dan Mullen. Um, that, that, that hasn't really been the case. It hasn't really been... Um, Florida under Dan Mullen internally wasn't really a hotbed for competition you know it was if you're in with dan you're in the lineup and that's what it was we saw with the quarterback battle you know i have no problem saying going into the season i wanted emory as a starter i think that's fair to say that was maybe not the the majority but but you know that was an acceptable take there um emory jones should be the starting quarterback that was my take and throughout the season i was saying you know emory's not great but I think he's better than AR. And then as the season went on, even I flipped to it's Anthony Richardson's time in Florida. Um, like, like I said, wasn't really the hotbed for competition. And like I've said on the show before, I was told before the season that pretty much all the players wanted Anthony Richardson as a starting quarterback. But Dan Mullen wanted Emory Jones. So that's what happened. Next week, the two teams in the orange and blue game, uh, they, they will, will figure out what the teams will be and they'll split up and they will practice separately as well. I'm interested to see how everything shakes out in terms of what the teams will be. Um, my assumption is that starting offense and backup defense will be on the same team and they will be taking on backup offense and starting defense so that starters play against the starters and backups play against the starter uh, backups play against the backups when it comes time for the spring game. I think that's a fair way to think about it. I think that's probably the best way to go about it, you know, in, in an iron sharpen irons kind of in an iron sharpens iron kind of way. Uh, I also understand the argument of starting O and starting D on the same team versus backup O and backup D because that's kind of that that's more of a you know, offense or the starters might have an easier go of things in certain areas. 
but your backups will have to step up in order to compete. So it really helps your depth, but I don't think that's the way to go about it. I think I think it's starting over, starting D, and backup overs, backup D. I think that's the way to go about it. I love it. Um, is it a spring game? Yes, but that mean, doesn't mean anything for the season, record-wise, no. But it's going to be what determines so much about the team. But like we we could talk about, it could decide maybe who's going to get the majority of the running back shares, who's going to get you know most of the snaps at corner, the offensive line. We've got like seven guys right now that are kind of in that competition that are kind of just being thrown around there. Where we'll figure it out. But uh, I love what it's going to determine. But I, I'm also curious. I'll say. Um, to know just how much of the playbook is going to be open because fans are allowed to watch the spring game. That's orange and blue game. Fans can be there. Um, but I'm not sure how much, because it's going to be televised as well. So I'm not sure how much we're really going to see, how many wrinkles we're going to see. Because when you look at a spring game, you could say, well, or any exhibition game, really, uh, you could say they're not going to do anything creative. Uh, they're going to keep their cards close to their chest, and that's that's fine. Uh, you could also say that they're going to be more creative than usual because opponents will be prepared for creativity and be expecting that more, and they're going to have to prepare for more. And then if they prepare for more, maybe you can kill them with the simple stuff. Um, you could also just say, well, it's not a game that counts, so have a little fun with it, and that could be the thought process as well. I have no problem with that. Um, but something that I'm really, really interested in because I want to know how the coaching is going to work out. Uh, sorry if he says anything from the time that I recorded this uh, until it releases. It's only been a few hours, so I would hope not. But just in case, uh, I'm curious to know how it's going to work coaching-wise. Because Florida's right now at the point where they've got a head coach who's going to, who's going to be in control of the offense. And they've got an offensive coordinator who's not going to call the plays. They've got a defensive play caller or a, defense, a co-defensive coordinator who's going to call the plays, and a co-defensive coordinator who's not going to call the plays. So what if we saw maybe Billy Napier and Patrick Tony joining forces versus Rob Sale and Sean Spencer? Or Billy Napier and Sean Spencer, so that you have one, one everyday play caller and one not, versus Rob Sale and Patrick Tony, so you have one everyday play caller and one everyday not. So I, I'm curious because, uh, look, st- uh, systematically, they're going to be very similar. Um, scheme-wise, not going to change much. The system is going to be the same. It's what they've been practicing in. But when you call those plays, is going to be interesting and seeing how it goes could be interesting. I'm very, very, very interested in seeing how it works. So I kind of wanted to be Billy Napier and Sean Spencer versus Rob Sale and Patrick Tony because I want to see Billy Napier's offense against Patrick Tony's defense. I, that's I, I, You guys know, schematically, I love them both. I, I, I love what they both do. So I, and They've been together for a few years now on coaching staffs, so I'd be very interested to see how they kind of, that, that chess match, how that would be. Uh, that's what I want to see. And I, I can tell you now, I don't remember the last time that I was this excited for a spring game, but... I'm there now. I'm very excited. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. We'll be back tomorrow with more on your Florida Gators. Now make your second listen. Lockdown NFL Draft. Ryan Tracy and former NFL cornerback Eric Crocker bring the NFL Draft to life every day with insight and analysis on college football prospects and NFL front offices. For Lockdown Gators, I'm Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with Whole Nine Sports. That is W-H-O-L-E-N-I-N-E Sports. And so you know, since I got asked on it yesterday by Josh Gardner, um, the reason I spell out the W-H-O-L-E-N-I-N-E is because I don't want people to put whole H-O-L-E and I don't want people to put the number nine. I want you to spell it out. That's how it's done on the website. So that's what it is. Uh, so that's Whole Nine Sports, the W-H-O-L-E-N-I-N-E Sports. And I will see you all tomorrow.